Praise the Lord. Come on, somebody say yes to that, right? All right. Let's take our Bibles out this morning. And I want you to go with me to the book of Hebrews chapter 4. Now, you're going to need a Bible this morning, so get it out. Because we're going to run all over the Word of God this morning. Hebrews chapter 4. Thank you, son. Hebrews chapter 4. I'm going to be... Uh, teaching today out of the New King James Version. So every scripture I give to you, I'll be reaching and quoting uh, other versions too. Des, it's good to see you. You're home from college. I saw a video of you running a ball. They thought it was you at your old high school and they said Des went around the corner. Was that you? Was that right? Oh, oh, was it? Okay. Okay. Uh, You did it on ESP. He got credit on ESP. And did you run? Was that you running the ball? No, but they gave you credit. Maybe they were prophesying, right? And so anyway, it sure is, sure is good to see you this morning. All right, Hebrews chapter 4. Y'all ready? You got something to write with. Today I want to talk to us on this subject of, and I'm going to be honest with you, I'm going to preach for a month on this. I'm going to come back to it Wednesday night. I'll be preaching on this Wednesday night. I will not move off this subject because the Lord has stirred me and, uh, and I just have been feeling this deeply in my spirit. And so today you're going to get a little old school Shane Warren. Old old school Shane Warren used to take a Bible like this and I used to stand there and quote about a hundred passages of scripture when I'd preach. And uh, I don't have as good a memory as I used to, but I didn't have a pulpit. I just would take the word of God and just take off on it. And God has dropped something in my spirit on this subject of the rest of God. The rest of God. And uh, we're going to talk about that for the next month at least. Every Sunday and every Wednesday. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 4. We're going to start there. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering into his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to come short of it. There is a promise that remains of entering into his rest. Jesus said, come unto me, all you who are labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. There is a place of rest in God. And the Bible says that if we're going to fear anything in life. Now, a few weeks ago, I preached on the fear virus. There is one thing the Bible gives you a right to fear. And it's right here. If you're going to fear anything, fear not finding this place of promise where you enter into the rest of God. Now, I'm going to describe in just a moment or define for you that place and what it looks like and what it feels like so that you know whether or not you're in that place. But the Bible says, let us fear lest any of you seem to come short of it. Notice now, for the indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word of God, now he's talking about the children of Israel who were brought out of Egypt, were in the, in the wilderness, were trying to come into the promised land. You remember they got to the edge of the promised land and they didn't come in. So he's speaking about that incident here now. He says, for indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them. Say that out loud, please. It did not profit them. Can you imagine the word of God making promises over your life, over my life, and it not working for us? Just because God said something over your life doesn't mean that it's going to come to pass. The word of God, God can give you a promise, but it It might not profit or work in your life. And there's a reason for it. Look, notice the next phrase. Not being mixed with faith. Just because God said it doesn't mean it's going to come to pass. There is a part that you have to play in this. You have to use faith to step into the promise that God has made for your life. So not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we who have believed do enter into that rest. As he has said, so I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although, watch now, the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Now again, he's talking about the children of Israel here. Who came to the border of the promised land. Sent 12 spies in. 10 spies came back with an evil report. 2 spies came back with a good report. Joshua and Caleb... And the Bible says the people latched on to the ten 
Spies Television Network news channel <laughs> and believed a report of unbelief. And because of that, even though there was a promise, watch now, there was a promise that was made over their life. They did not enter into that promise because they did not mix what they heard with faith. Instead, they mixed what they heard, the promise of God, with unbelief. God said, I'm going to give you the land. And so the writer of Hebrews now is talking about that moment. And he said, they didn't realize that all the works of God were finished from the foundation of the world. Now, I want you to think about that for a moment. Think about the sovereignty of God. Think about the divine providence of Almighty God. That everything that God is ever going to do, God has already done. When God creates something, folks, He doesn't create like you and I do. He doesn't create here and kind of build it as He goes. God is not getting up every day wondering what He's going to do today to solve the world's problems. All of the world's problems today, none of them are taking God by surprise. He already knew everything that was going to be today. See, God is not restricted by time. God is above time. He's outside of time, yet He's in time, and time is in Him. And because God is outside of time, everything is now to him. So he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. If in God's mind, yesterday is now, now is now, and tomorrow will be now. Tomorrow has already happened in God. All his works were finished from the foundation of the world. Can I teach y'all for a moment? Yes. Tomorrow's already happened in God. That's the reason Jesus said, don't think about your life, what you're going to eat or drink, what you're going to put on, what you're going to do for money. You don't have to worry about that because I've already taken care of your tomorrow. God has already been in your tomorrow because your tomorrow is already in God. So God, who's above time, watch, tomorrow is now to God. Now is now to God. Yesterday is now to God. So watch this. The Bible says... Now, faith is. Faith is always a now thing because everything is now to God. So everything God is ever going to do for you has already been accomplished. It's been done. It was done before the foundations of the world. I want you to think about this, folks, the divine providence of God, that in his foreknowledge, Romans chapter 8, those whom he foreknew, he did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. God's divine foreknowledge went down through time that didn't even exist yet, just in his mind. He created and did everything that he needed to do and then came back to eternity past, and he started it. He said, let there be, and everything started according to what he created. And I want you to think about this. Since that time, since Genesis chapter 1 and 2, God has never created anything again. You say, sure he has. No, he hasn't. God created trees and gave the ability to the trees to reproduce after their own kind. He, get, he created animals and gave the ability of the animals to reproduce after their own kind. This is the reason I can't fall in line with some of all of this crazy, hypocritical, uh, green earth theories that we have right now. And I'm going I'm to just give you an example. Everybody talks about following the science. Let me give you some facts for some science. What about this for science? Did you know there's double the amount of trees right now in America than there was when the pilgrims arrived? Did you know that? Why is that? Because God anticipated the growth of the world. God anticipated the population boom. God anticipated everything in the future. How can God know what's coming in the future? Because God's already been in the future. And God has finished everything from the foundation of the world. Even the cross of Christ was taken care of back there. The Bible says Jesus was the lamb slain before the foundation of the earth. Now it manifested in time, 4,000 years into human uh, biblical history, it manifested in time at that moment. But in heaven, it was already done. It was already settled. It didn't take God by surprise. 
that Jesus died on the cross. All of his works were finished from the foundation of the world. So watch this. The scripture says that when God created the heavens and the earth on the seventh day, what did God do? He rested from his labor. God's not creating anything else. He's already taken care of everything. He's already created anything and everything that never needs to be created. He's already formed it. He's already supplied it. It's already taken care of. God's not in heaven scratching his head today trying to figure out how to take care of your tomorrow. He's already taken care of your tomorrow. Folks, that ought to make you happy because that means nothing is going to take God by surprise and nothing is going to defeat you because God's already put enough grace in your tomorrow to make it through the storms of life. Right? All his works were finished. So notice what the writer of Hebrews is saying here. He's saying, do you realize God already predestined this thing for the promised land for the children of Israel? It had nothing to do with the will of God. The will of God, God's mind was already made up concerning the children of Israel about the promise of coming into the promised land. God already knew about the Egyptian bondage. God already knew how he'd break the back of Pharaoh. God already knew how they would be in the wilderness. God already knew there were going to be giants in the land. They didn't have to send spies into the land. All they had to do was lean on the power of the Holy Ghost. They didn't have to send spies into the land. God already knew about the giants in the land. But everybody got their eyes on the natural instead of relying on or resting in what God had already accomplished for them. He had already gained the victory for them. Folks, I'm not trying to get the victory today. I've already got the victory in Christ. Right? Right? All his works were finished from the foundation of the world. I could preach on that for a long time, but I'm going to keep moving here. For he has spoken in a certain place on the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all of his works. And again, in this place, they shall not enter into my rest. Since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter in because of disobedience. Now he's not talking about a place on the earth. He's talking about a place in God. Right? Again, he designates a certain day saying in David, Today, after such a long time, it has been said, Today, if you will hear his voice and do not harden your hearts. In other words, he's saying David was dealing with this. In other words, David had promises over his life. And David was trying to figure out how to enter into the promises of his life as well. So it's not just an Egypt thing. It's not just a children of Israel thing. This is all through the scripture. So a place of rest isn't the promised land in the natural Israel. A place of rest is a place in God where you can rest in the fact that God is taking care of everything in your life and you don't have to worry about it, struggle about it, fret about it. You can just rest in God. Now look at verse number 8. For if Joshua had given them rest, he would not afterward have spoken of another day. Therefore remains, there remains therefore a rest for the people of God. Say that out loud with me, please. There remains therefore a rest for the people of God. Now notice verse number 10. For he who has entered his rest, talking about God's rest, capital there. He who has entered his rest has himself, lowercase letter, also ceased from his works. As God did. Uh Uh-oh. Did you know when you're trying to make something happen, you're not in faith? Now, folks, let that set in on you. When you're trying to make something happen, when you're trying to push every door open, and I'm not saying you should not be on the offensive. There's some people just waiting on God to do everything, and God's partnered with you. I'm not saying, but I'm saying sometimes... We're trying so hard to make something happen that if we're not careful, we'll open a door that God never intended for us to walk through. The Bible says, if we have entered into this place in God where God is resting, if we've entered into that place of rest, one of the ways we'll know that is we'll cease from our labor. In other words, we'll quit trying to struggle to make something happen in our life or to get God to do something in our life. Now, listen to me, folks. Everybody look right here. The majority of the Christians I know spend their entire Christian experience trying to make God do something. In fact, this is what they've, that's what they've determined prayers for. I'm going to pray and beg God and I'm going to make God do something. 
or I'm going to prophesy and I'm going to make God do something, or I'm going to go to church a certain amount of times and I'm going to make God do something. i tell you why. I'm going to give a certain offering and I'm going to make God do something. You can't make God do anything. Everything God is ever going to do, He's already done. He has rested from His labor. What you need to do is enter into what God has already done for your life. See, God has a will for your life. God has a plan for your life. And the best thing you could do is find that thing that God has already accomplished, even though it has not manifested in time yet. This is so good. Find that thing that God has already accomplished for you, even though it has not manifested in time, and then rest in that promise. Just say, I know this is a promise over my life. I'm going to depend on God. I'm going to do my part. I'm going to do what I can, but I'm going to depend on God to manifest that thing in time. As Jesus said, let us pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. The scripture says, as he is, so are we in this world. God has a right now plan for our life that's already been settled in eternity past. God is not trying to create anything. He's already created everything you need. He's already taken care of everything you need. He's already provided everything you need. You don't have to worry about it anymore. All you've got to do is is struggle to find that place in God, the will of God for your life, and rest in what the Lord has done for you. All right. Four of you are getting it, but we're, we're going to keep going here. All right. Uh, let's, let's read verse 11. Let us therefore be diligent. I like the King James. It says, let us therefore labor. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. Again, what are we laboring to do? Are we laboring to get the victory? Are we laboring to get healed? Are we laboring to walk in prosperity? Are we laboring to get a building? Are we laboring to buy land? No, I need to labor in the fact that God's already, before I ever got here, picked out the land, picked out the building, picked out the place. All I've got to do is find where God has already done it. And then watch what happens. I don't have to make it happen. I just step right into what's already taken place in the heavens and what's in heaven will manifest upon the earth in the right time. That's the reason the scripture says to everything there is a time and a season and a, and, a t- and a time for every purpose. God has purposes that are eternal purposes that he is working out in time to make happen just for me. God loves you so much he's got a picture of you in his wallet. God loves you so much on a mantle in heaven. He's got a picture of you and your family. And he's thinking about you. That's how much God loves you. And that's how much God is orchestrating for you. I guess what I'm trying to tell you folks is quit trying so hard to get the victory. And just live in the victory that Jesus has already given you. God has already taken for you. Now, I want us to go over here to the book of Ephesians. And let's talk about some of the works that have been finished. What has God already done for us? Did you know the Bible says God has done some things for us? Past tense. Past tense. That I should be walking in right now. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus, faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be to you. Peace from God and our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I love how he starts his grace be to you. And then it's like he starts talking about everything that grace has made available for you. Folks, grace is not a license to live immorally. immorally. Grace is an empowerment to take possession of everything that God has already provided you before the earth began. That's what grace is. So that's the reason he starts out with grace. And Ephesians is a really interesting book. Look at this. The first three chapters of of Ephesians is telling you who you are in him and what he's done for you. The last three chapters of Ephesians is telling you how to possess it. And then you get to Ephesians chapter 6, the great warfare passage. It's not a warfare against the devil. The warfare is for us to step into what God has already done for us. We're not fighting the devil. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, 
but against principalities, powers, and, and spirits, and all of these uh, different spirits in heavenly places. Folks, we're not even fighting them to get what belongs to us. Here's what we're doing. We're fighting them to keep ourselves in a position of faith because everything the devil wants to do is pull you out. He wants to pull you out of that place of faith in God so that you cannot possess the promise of God in your life. I'm not fighting the devil to try to get what God's already given me. No, it's already done. I'm fighting the devil to keep me from getting in a mindset or getting in a place, right? It's deception. Help me, Lord. So what has Jesus given us? His works have been finished from the foundation of the earth. What has he given you? Well, the Bible tells you right here, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. Look at that. What has Jesus given you? He has blessed. Everybody say he has. I love the King James that says he hath. Much more pronounced on that present tense. He hath blessed us. He's not blessing us now. He's already blessed us in eternity long before you ever got here or the earth was ever created. God had already had a day with your name on it. Knew you was going to be sitting right here at the bend this morning. And he has blessed you, past tense, with every, everybody say every, every. spiritual blessing in heavenly places. So there's not anything spiritually that you don't already have. I want you to think about what I just said to you. There's not anything spiritually that you don't already have. Galatians chapter 5, according to by the Holy Ghost, you've been given the nine fruit of the Spirit. Fruit, singular, with nine dimensions to the fruit. One fruit, nine dimensions. You got the same Holy Ghost on the inside of you that Jesus had on the inside of him. When you got born again, your spirit man became like a little Jesus in you. The same Holy Ghost on the inside of you. Everything you need spiritually, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, temperance, whatever you need in God, you've already got it. You don't have to try to have joy. You already got it. You've been given every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, in Christ Jesus, long before the world ever began. In fact, can I show you a scripture here? I want you to go to the book of 2 Peter. 2 Peter, let me just show you what I'm talking about. 2 Peter chapter, and this isn't going to be on the screen. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse number 2. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord as his divine power. Look at this. As his divine power has given. There's past tense again. To us all things. Everybody say all things. things. Now watch. That pertain to life and godliness. God hasn't already given me just spiritual things. The Bible says his divine power has given us All things that pertain to life and godliness. He's not just taking care of your spiritual walk, folk. He's already taking care of everything you need in this life. You say, Pastor, I don't have enough money. Well, he's already given it to you. Healing, he's already given it to you. Protection for your kids, he's already given it to you. Everything that pertains to life and godliness in Christ Jesus has already been given unto you. It's been settled. It's been done. It's already been provided. It's already been provided. My God. Think about what I'm telling you this morning. You don't have to go struggle to get it. It's already been provided. All you've got to do is believe what he said and by faith possess what he has put in your at your disposal. Now watch that. He's by his divine power, he's given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. But how do we access it? Right here, through the knowledge. Everybody say, through the knowledge. (laughs) Through the knowledge of him who has called us by glory and virtue, by which we have been given exceedingly great and precious promise. There's that past tense again. God has already given it. So look at me. The issue is not whether God has done it. The issue is not whether God has already supplied it. The issue is whether you know how to get it. 
How do you possess it? You possess it by faith through knowledge of what he's already done for you. And the reason most people haven't possessed it is because they don't know what's already been provided for them. So let's go back to Ephesians chapter 1 over here. Is this good for everybody? All right, let's go over here. Ephesians chapter 1. Let's go back to verse number 3. Blessed be God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. And I can go ahead and say, and everything I need for life and godliness in the heavenly place in Christ. He's blessed me. How do I get it? How do I get it? I got to come to a knowledge of what he's done for me. Because what you don't know is killing you. My people are destroyed. For the lack of knowledge, if I don't know it's there, I can't get it. You've got millions of dollars in, the, in God's banking account, and you, you don't even know it's there. So therefore, you're not going and making a withdrawal. If you had money in your bank to get what you needed tomorrow, would you go make a withdrawal? If I showed you today that you had money in your bank, would you go make a withdrawal? Of course you would. You'd take your debit card, put in your PIN number, and you'd get all the money to meet your need. Well, I'm telling you, everything you ever need in life has already been provided in Jesus Christ 2,000 years before God ever created the heavens and the earth. God's already rested from in that. He said, I'm not working. I don't have to work, try to make it happen. I've already filled all the storehouses of heaven with everything that you need in life, but you've got to take possession of it. How do you do it? You get a knowledge. That's the reason you got to get into the word of God. Get knowledge of what he's provided you. And then you got to use faith to get it. Uh, you don't believe me. Just let's put a pause right there. Let's put a pause right there. Let's go to Ephesians 2. I want to show you Ephesians 2, verse number 8. Ephesians 2, verse 8. Y'all quote this all the time. Look at it. For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus, watch now, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. It's already been done, folks. So how do I get it? Well, I got to come into a knowledge of what he's already provided for me. You got to come into a knowledge spiritually. You got to come into a knowledge in your natural life. What are the promises of God in every dimension of my life? Once I come into knowledge, I got to access it by faith. I got to mix what he said with faith and possess the promise of God. Now watch this. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Grace and faith is a gift. Grace is God's gift to you. It's God's part. Faith is your gift to God. It's your part. How am I saved? By grace, but I got to do it through faith. Jesus has already died for the sins of the whole world. Y'all believe that? Which means he's already paid the price for every sinner in the entire world. But yet he turned around and said, Broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be that go in thereat. Narrow is the way that leads to life everlasting, and few there be that find it. Even though he died for everybody. Even though he wants, he's already provided deliverance for everybody. Not everybody is going to walk in that because they have to ac access that promise through faith. By grace, through faith. And this is what the preaching of the Word of God is about. The preaching of the Word of God gives them knowledge. That's, a, that's over there in 2 Peter. It gives them knowledge... So that they can, by faith, possess what grace has provided for them. Amen. So just because God has spoken something, just because Jesus has died for something, doesn't mean necessarily that you walk in it. You've got to have a knowledge of it, folks. And you've got to exercise faith to possess the promises of God. I'm preaching so good right now. In fact, let's just go over here. We might as well go do it. Romans chapter 3. I'm never going to get through Ephesians 1. I give up. <laughs> Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. 
verse 27. Romans chapter 3, verse 27. Where is boasting then? It is excluded by what law? Of works? Are you going to get the promises of God through your works? No. You don't have to work for it. It's already been worked for. He ceased from his labor. Quit trying so hard. I'm going to pray pray two hours a day and God's going to do it. You You can lock yourself up in a closet and pray two or three hours a day and God might not ever do it. Prayer doesn't move God. Prayer moves you. God can't move. I just messed you up there. God can't move. Movement implies limitation. If I move from this side of the platform to this side of the platform, I cease to be over there in order to be here. If I move over there... From here, I cease to be over there, to be here. God can't move because if he moves, he ceases to be. It implies he ceases to be in one dimension in order to be in another dimension. But God's everywhere at all time, in all things, all the time. He's in heaven, but David said, if I make my bed in hell, he's there. Yet he's also with you, even to the ends of the earth. How's he with you and with me? Well, he has an attitude. He thinks he's God. (laughs) So God is not moving, folks. What does prayer do? Prayer doesn't move God. Prayer moves me in God. Prayer moves me to the next place that God has already accomplished a finished work in my life. It moves me. Prayer is not about getting God. I'm going to put God in an arm lock. You say, well, hold it. Well, he wrestled with Jacob, and Jacob finally got his blessing. Go read the passage. The Bible says Jacob wrestled with a man. You think Jacob's really going to be able to hold God down, pin him down, and make him blessing? Come on, folks. Read the context of the passage. Do you know who Jacob was was wrestling with? Jacob was wrestling with... Between Jacob and Israel, both those men existed on the inside of him. And they were both fighting. Who was going to be in control? You know there's two men. Boy, this is so good right now. Did you know there's two men that that are in you? You got this old man after the flesh, the carnal man. And then you got the spiritual man. And that old Jacob is wrestling with with the Israel on the inside of you. The promise of God on the inside of you. So when Israel finally got, or Jacob finally come to grips and he wrestled with himself, he changed the way he walked. Right. Selah, go study. If I'm preaching it wrong, I'll eat the leather on your Bible. <laughs> go check it out. Do a word study on it. See if I'm lying about it. Watch this. So where do we boast? Is it because of some law of works? Is that, that what we've done? We've worked ourselves into the promise of God? No, what's it, what's it, what, what, what law governs? The law of faith. He said, no, it's the law of faith. Look at me. Here's the law. Here's the law. Gravity. Right there. Everybody pick your Bible up. Put it right over your lap. One, two, three, drop it. Isn't that amazing? Gravity is not a respecter of person. Gravity didn't all of a sudden make its mind up that it wasn't going to work in your hands, in your life. But isn't that what Christians do? Well, healing doesn't belong to me. Healing belongs to some people. Well, the Holy Ghost don't belong. The baptism of the Holy Ghost don't belong to me. It belongs to some people. Well, the gifts of the Spirit don't belong to me. It belongs to some people. No, it's the same law of faith. And if you'll exercise the law of faith by grace through faith, you can possess the promises of God for your life. They've all, God's already made up his mind about what he wants to do in your life. He's already provided everything that pertains to life and godliness. Now it's up to us by grace through faith to take possession of the promises of God. How long are we going to live like paupers when he's called us kings? How long are we going to be broke, busted, and disgusted when he's called us to prosper? 
The Bible says in Psalms, God takes pleasure in the prosperity of His people. I'm amazed at Christian people that think being broke is a blessing. Anybody who's been broke will tell you it's not a blessing, it's a curse. Right? But I'm amazed at Christian people. They think, well, if, if it, you know, being blessed, being broke is a blessing. Well, if you're broke, you can't do nothing for God. That's right. You can't do nothing for your kids or your grandkids. That's right. The Bible says God takes pleasure in the prosperity of his people. God wants you blessed. Why in the world do you think God wants Hugh Hefner to have all the money? That don't even make any logical sense. No, God, listen, God's best friend was a billionaire. Abraham. Go read the Bible. God has no problem with you having money. God has God wants people healed. God wants people blessed. God God Jesus paid for all of it. Listen, God wants you to have peace. God wants you to have joy. God wants you to walk fearlessly. God wants you to have courage. God wants you to be bold as a lion. God didn't call you to live beneath those privileges. Let me tell you what's done that. Religion's taught us that mess. Religion has taught us that we can't have certain things and can't do certain things unless I somehow or another manipulate God by living up to a certain standard. You're not good enough to get God's blessing. I got news for you. God's not deciding whether he's go he loves you or bless you, going to save you, heal you, deliver you. He's not deciding today whether he's done. He's already decided that before you were ever born. And the mere fact you're sitting here listening to a preacher when you could be at home watching a football game tells me that God has something good for your life. God says, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. They are good thoughts to give you a hope and a future. God wants you to be blessed in everything you do. God wants I want you to be incredibly blessed in everything you do. I'm trying to build your faith this morning. Let's go back to Ephesians 1. I got five more minutes. And I'm going to take it. Somebody asked me, so why do you preach so long? I said, well, I only get them an hour a week. The world gets you all the other time. I got an hour a week to try to put this stuff in you. So I've been blessed. Notice this. Just as he is, has chosen us in him before the foundation. I've been chosen. This is all, this is all before time. I've been blessed with every spiritual blessing. I've been chosen before the foundation of the world. Look at verse 5. I've been predestined to be adopted as a son. Predestined. Oh, here's a good one. Can I give you this one? Oh, let, let's just read that. Having predestined us to adoptions as sons by Jesus Christ himself, according to his good, the good pleasure of his will. To the praise of the glory of his grace, by which, watch now, he made us accepted in the blood. Now, this is before the foundation of the world. Accepted in the blood. Now, I'm telling you right now, if you've got a pen and if you've ever underlined in your Bible, you need to underline that word accepted. Because it's only used one other time in the entire Bible. That Greek word is only used one other time in the entire Bible. Would y'all like to know where it's used? Yeah. Oh, really? Well, let's go over to the book of Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. Let me show you what he means by that. Now, this is all before the foundation of the world. God's not deciding whether or not he's going to do it now. He's already decided it. Well, <coughs> Kenneth Hagin didn't come up with this, folks. <laughs> Copeland didn't come up with this. I was preaching at a church in South Carolina. And I said, I know some of y'all think Kenneth Hagin and Kenneth Copeland came up with this. Copeland Hagin didn't come up with this. <laughs> All right. Y'all ready? Now, this is verse 26. Now, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man who was named, whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you 
among women. The three words, highly favored one, in the New King James, is the only other time the word accepted is used. It's the same word here as in Ephesians chapter 1. You say, well, what does that mean? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let's go back over to Ephesians 1 here. I told you you're going to need your Bible. To the praise of His glory and grace, verse 6, by which He has already made us accepted in the blood. In the beloved. Do you know that God looking at you this morning, he looks at you like he does his own mama? Highly favored. I wish you could get what I just said to you. Highly, You say, oh, you're casting shade on his mom. I would never touch Jesus' mama. Nobody better mess with mine. I'm definitely not messing with Jesus' mama. I'm not trying to mess with Jesus' mama, but listen to what Jesus said. When they said, oh, he said, blessed must have been the woman. They come to him and said, blessed must have been the woman that had you. He said, and he said, no. He said, blessed are the ones who hear my words and do them. If you think Mary's blessed for having me, blessed are those who love me and hear my words and do them. If you're a child of God, how heaven looks at you is highly favored one. Same way it looked at Mary, that it would come down. The Holy Ghost would choose Mary amongst all the other people on the planet. The Holy Ghost would come down and choose Mary and brood over her womb and conceived the son of the living God. God says, I love you so much. Here's how I think about you. I've already in the past, for you were ever even a thought in anybody's mind, I've already decided you're my favored one. And if we had to do it again, I'd choose you just like I chose Mary. You say, well, hold it, pastor. That's not how I feel. Well, that's the problem. You're going and looking in the wrong mirror. You say, well, when I... See, you're looking in, in the natural mirror. The natural mirror. You go and look and you see wrinkles, and bulges, and bifocals, and bunions, and balding. Right? You see all that stuff and you say, oh, I, I don't... You know, I'm highly... I don't look highly favored. Well, the problem is you're looking at the wrong man. Man, wouldn't it be wonderful... If we had a mirror that every time we looked at it, all we did was saw, see Jesus. Oh, hang on. We do. In the book of James, it says, he who looks into the perfect law of liberty beholds what manner of man that he is. That's what the word of God's for. Every time I look in it, it tells me what I look like. I look like as he is. So are we in this world right now as he is. Is Jesus broke? Is Jesus busted? Is Jesus disgusted? Is Jesus depressed? Is Jesus miserable? Is Jesus uh, living in sin? Is Jesus all bound up? No, folks. Well, as he is, so are we in this world. It's already been chosen before the world ever began. This is what I, this is my inheritance. This is my inheritance. Now, I'll be doggone if I'm going to let the devil or any religious person talk me out of what Jesus died to give me 2,000 years ago and what the Father designed me to have way before the earth was ever created. Not going to happen. Well, Ephesians 1, I, I got to just listen. We'll come back to this Wednesday. In Him we have redemption. Verse 7. Verse number 8. Which He made abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of His will. I've got a, I've got a message that I used to do, do years ago on finding and fulfilling the will of God. I'm going to teach. When we get down here, I'm going to teach on how to find the will of God. God has already got a will for your life, a purpose for your life, right? 
uh, according to his good pleasure which he purchased in himself that in the dispensation of the fullness of time he might gather together one in all things in Christ both uh, which are in heaven and on the earth in him. In him we have also obtained an inheritance. Past tense. It's already been given to us. Verse number 13, in him also you trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. That was, that was already given. That was already provided. Folks, all of this has already been provided. I'm not trying to get it. It's already mine. I don't have to work for it. Actually, what I got to do is I got to cease from my labor. That's right. And I got to rest. Come unto me. Are you tired? Are you weary? Come unto me. All you that labor and are heavy laden, Jesus said, and I will give you rest. You can, you can find a place in God where you'll be just like as relaxed as Jesus is right now. I know y'all got the Jesus in your mind up there and he's just wringing his hands, making intercession for everybody, trying to figure out how to answer all the world's problems. No, my friend, when Jesus hung on the cross, watch, and he said, it is finished. He put an exclamation point on all of the promises of God for every believer who would place faith in him. So look at me today. What do you need? What do you need? What do you need? You say, well, pastor, I need healing. 1 Peter 2, 24. By his stripes, ye were healed 2,000 years ago. It's already done. 2,000 years ago. You're already healed. You don't need to get healing. You've already got it. You just need through knowledge by faith to possess what's already in you. Well, pastor, I, I need prosperity. Well, you've already got it. Everything you need to, for, to prosper, witty inventions, ideas, dreams, it's already in you. You don't have to struggle for it. All you got to do is through knowledge, find out what the will of God is for you in that area and possess it by faith. Peace. You already got it. It's on the inside. The Holy Ghost on the inside of you. You've already got it. You just got to get in that place of peace. And it's hard, isn't it? To operate in peace all the time. But if you don't get there, you'll go crazy trying to make things happen. When you don't have to make anything happen. God has already made it happen. You've just got to position yourself under the spout where the glory is being poured out. And get in alignment with the will of God. And what is in heaven will come to your life just as fast. It will manifest in time. What do you need this morning? Now I'm going to ask Adam and the worship team to come. I don't know where they're at. They'll come on. And here's what we're going to do today. I'm going to pray for people. If you've got a need, we're going to lay hands on you this morning and we're going to pray not for God to do it, but we're going to pray in faith together as if it's already done. And you're going to receive today. Everybody say faith. Faith, faith is the word metron, which literally means to receive. That's all it is. Faith is your capacity to receive. Faith is your capacity to receive. You say, well, hold it, Pastor. Well, that ruins me right there because I don't have any faith. Well, the Bible says in the book of Romans that God has dealt to every man a measure of faith. You say, well, I don't have very much faith. Well, let me tell you what the Word of God says. The Word of God says that if you have faith the size of a grain of mercy seed, you could say to this mountain, be thou removed and cast to the sea, and it will get up and do it. You don't have to have a lot. You just have to use what you got. Right? Amen. 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 This last week I've been frustrated and I was mad about buildings. And, and the Lord spoke to me and said, just rest in me. It's going to happen. I said, well, God, this one and that one. He said, just Quit worrying about it. It's going to happen. 
And so I've just been riding around. I figure whenever I find the place, it'll just come to me. And you know what? I might not even find it all knowing how God works. Somebody's liable to call me and say, I don't know if you need a building, but I happen to have a building. I know this, God owns a cattle on a thousand hills and everything here belongs to Him. It don't belong to any man, it belongs to Him. I'm not going to worry about it. I'm not going to lose any sleep over it. It's not going to affect my eating habits. I'm going to have fried chicken today. Quit letting the devil talk you out of what Jesus has already given you. Right? Let's stand up all over this room. If you're in here today, you say, Pastor, I'll be honest. I'm going through something right now. And I need to take possession of some of these promises you're talking about. I need you to get out of your seat. Come right up here to the front, the altar. We're going to pray real quickly. Now, as they're coming, I want everybody to listen. If you need to leave today because you've got some place to be, and I know some's got to get to a funeral and things of that nature, we're going to dismiss you, and the ushers will be standing at the back, and you can, you can drop your offering. You can give back there on your way out. I trust you. If we have to manipulate people into giving, I just quit. I, I'm not, I trust you. I'm not worried about it. So today, I love you. And I'm preaching like this because I want us all to step up to the place that God has for our life. I believe God's got better things for us than we could ever imagine right now. Amen? So, Adam's getting ready to just sing a little bit here. And I'm going to ask him to sing that song about the goodness of God. And uh, as they do this song with the track, I just want us to pray up here for just a moment right now. And we've got, is there anybody else? Come on. Come on. If you need to come, come on. Come on. Jesus. All right. I need my prayer team. If you will, come in behind. I need one prayer team member behind each person. More people are coming. Let them come on up. Just say, Lord, I thank you. It's already mine. Whatever it is you're believing God for, just say, Lord, I thank you. It's already mine. I'm just going to rest. It might not look like it right now, but I'm going to rest that it's already mine. I have it. It's been paid for. I claim it. I'm stepping into it right now in Jesus' name. <laughs> 